I've been on the board for, uh, well, the advisory board now, the official board for a few years now of a group called the National College Advising Corps that does the same thing that Teach for America does, except instead of placing recent college graduates in schools to do teaching, they place them in schools to do only college advising. So all they do is get in there and help these kids go on to college. Uh, I see that as a very, very important piece. The second part of education that I would talk about and that I think we need to help the local governments with is our developmental education system. Our developmental education is the graveyard in higher education. We know, for example, that about 50% of students who go into our community colleges, at the Alamo colleges, for example, are placed into some level of remedial developmental education. And you can spend up to two years in development oil without getting a single college credit and without getting financial aid. So what happens is that people are often in this work school tug of war, uh, made harder by the fact that you know there's cuts to the threats to cut Pell grants and there were cuts to Texas grants in 2011, uh, financial aid. And so people are in this work school tug of war and ultimately our folks will often choose work over college uh, and will go way into the workforce and then life happens and they don't come back. Uh, so I think we can be helpful. I would say if there's two areas that we should be helpful on, it's those ones. How big is the gap between, uh, the learning gap, education gap between whites and non-whites in Texas? That's a good question, yeah. I think you're the one in the higher education committee. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a very good question. He might have a better answer than me. <laughs> It's still significant, actually. You know, I, I was vice chairman of the Higher Education Committee in the Texas legislature, uh, and Dan Bryant from Dallas, who's a native of San Antonio, was my chairman. He's still the chairman now. Um, but in, in the year 2000 or 2001, as you all know, Texas set targets called closing the gaps, right? Uh, targets for how many, how many uh, white students, African American students, Hispanic students we should enroll in school by 2015. The only category Texas was lagging behind in as of last year when I left was among Hispanic students. Uh, that was the only category. It also happens to be the population that's booming the most, right? That's growing the fastest. Uh, so I would say it's a, it's, it's a significant gap and it's one that is disconcerting, I think, to everybody in public ed and higher ed in Texas. So how do you close it? Uh, well, I think working on those two areas that I spoke about, uh, would, especially the college advising part, uh, would, be, would be very helpful. Uh, it, it's been a real debate in Texas because, you know, Texas was the state under Governor Bush in the 1990s that really started to pioneer uh, standardized and high stakes testing. And now there's been a movement away from that. Uh, we know what happened with the STARS test. And, you know, and, and the state backing away from that, even though it was passed in 2011. Uh, and so, you know, I think we've got to do a better job of the substantive preparation, but also a better job of two other things, sending students to college, putting in an infrastructure that gets it done. And then the second thing is doing what the Alamo colleges are doing well right now, which is uh, the, the, the Alamo academies where they partner with Lockheed Martin with other groups, with folks in the healthcare industry. That is a model program that helps guides, guide high school students into vocational certifications and other programs, and also will help them go into college and get a degree uh, when they're ready to do that. So I think if, you know, for our city, if we can do those things, uh, I think we'll be in better shape. Yeah, I, I would just add that in terms of closing that gap, that that, that was the idea behind focusing on four-year-olds, uh, that you want to make sure that these children never get behind in the first place. And uh, to the extent that you can do it in a way that's uh, neutral in terms of ethnicity or, or even income, I would like to see it extended to everyone, to all the children. Uh, I think that the entire community is a winner for that. Uh, and uh, the fact that the president has advocated for universal pre-K, I believe, to the extent that he's able to get that done uh, with Congress, will be a great benefit to the United States in terms of making it more uh, competitive in the future. What are the chances he gets that done, though, Congressman? Obviously, that's a, that's a heavy lift. Um, you know, but I think, possible. I think I think he may be able to get it done before his term is up. Does um, he have to win the control of the House to do it? What's that? Does he have to win control of the House to do it? Probably. What are the chances that you're going to win the House with uh, 
You look at there, there's maybe seven competitive districts out there right now. The man just doesn't. Well, doesn't. I mean, you know, I mean, taking back uh, when we're down, you know, we're down 200 to 235. Certainly, that that takes a bit of effort and time. Uh, but I think we're on our way back. Uh, and of course, you know, Democrats held the House, as you know, from 2006 to 2010, and then there was a big wave um, that that replaced that with a, a Republican majority. So I think it's very possible. Um, but do you, do you really think it's possible? I mean, I do. seriously, when I look at the landscape, last I looked, there was literally seven or eight competitive districts. I don't. I know. think there's there's you know at least a few seats at stake still in Texas because of redistricting, and in Florida a few I believe. Uh, but look, there's no question that that to do it in two years would take another wave election. But I would also point out that if you look at modern American politics and the Congress specifically. From the 1950s to the 1990s, the Democratic Party controlled Congress almost uncontested except for that period in the 80s. That was about a 40-year period where one party had dominion over the Congress. And then from 1994, with the Republican wave and Newt Gingrich, to 2006, you had a Republican wave, right from 06 to 08, right around there. So that wave was, you go from 40 years to 12 years, and then from 06 to 2010, now you went from 40 years to 12 years to four years. So I was wondering for 2012, you know, when there was a lot of talk by Democrats, we were going to take back all these seats, uh, the implications of having a system where you're constantly changing the majority party. Uh, as a Democrat, I was hoping it would happen, uh, but as an American, I think it's something to really think about. And one of the reasons that I'm, I'm optimistic is that I think that, that uh, Pre-K is something that that cuts across party lines. Now, you know, it's spending, so it's not going to get support of, of folks who won't spend for anything. But it does get moderate Republican support, um, and there are still there's enough. such a thing. Uh, <laughs> enough, <laughs> just <laughs> enough. Well, I also I do remember that in the Texas legislature, you all, you all probably remember um, that uh, Diane Patrick, who's a state rep from North Texas, passed a version of universal pre-K that had bipartisan support in the Texas legislature, which was saying a lot, uh, and that was vetoed by Governor Perry. And so there is a predicate there to get Republican support for it. Speaking of Governor Perry, mm -hmm. there are 6.2, 6 6.3 million uninsured Texans, correct? Mm -hmm. um, do you think the governor should uh, take uh, Medicaid expansion under Obamacare? Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think he and I both agree that 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 uh, that it makes sense for Texas to accept those funds. Uh, you know, even if you have to do it in some modified way, the way that Arkansas is going to do it, um, some way that is tailored to Texas specifically. But the the, the investment in good health care is too important. And a lot of people think of Medicaid, and they think that well, that's just limited to people a very low means, but you know, it's folks who are disabled, it's elderly, it, the, the impact is much broader. So I certainly believe that it would be a net positive for Governor Perry to accept those funds. I, mean, I, think, I think that Chris Christie set a great example for Republican governors. If you've watched his press conference, he said, look, this thing is 100% paid for, for till 2017. And if we don't participate in this program, it's not like the federal government isn't going to spend the money. That money is just going to go to other states. So I think it's the wise thing to do. I think there's more Republican uh, support for it that's growing. But I also, quite frankly, think that it's unconscionable for the governor to deny health care coverage to millions of people when it is 100% paid for by Texas taxes, by other people's taxes in this country. And to say to these people that I'm going to make a decision that you cannot have access to health care because, I mean, I, I think that it's a political decision, uh, but I think when it's 100% paid for, I think it's unconscionable. You know, even when it hits 90% in 2017, uh, that gives you an argument, okay, you know, I don't want to pay the 10%. But when you're not paying for any of it, I think it's unconscionable. Well, you mentioned Governor Christie. He's getting uh, severe criticism from within his own party. Um, sure. A party that is w wants to really keep the lid on, on federal spending. Do you at least understand Governor Perry's politics here, why he doesn't want to do it? Oh, for him. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, the state hasn't been competitive in 20 years in November, right? So I think he's worried about Greg Abbott on his right. 
he doesn't want to appeal to embrace Obamacare because he's worried about a challenge to the right. I mean, Senator Cruz, Senator Cruz, I think, sent a big scare through a lot of the established Republican politicians in the state because he came in as a Tea Party, a Tea Party candidate and was able, having never held office before, to run an insurgent campaign and beat a very wealthy sitting lieutenant governor. I think you have a lot of those guys that are there knowing that they don't have a November race, that are worried about being challenged on the right. So even when something appears reasonable to most Texans, and surveys have now shown that most Texans would expand Medicaid, uh, in other words, would take you know, what, the, what Washington is offering, uh, even when that's the case, they're so fearful of a challenge to the right because they, they, you know, they don't have to worry about November, that you know, that's the politics. Does it make sense of the politics? Sure, I think you know, until the state becomes more balanced, it becomes more competitive in November, if your concern as a politician is holding on to your job, it makes sense to do that. Okay. Uh, speaking of politics, what's the most, the, the smartest political way to handle uh, immigration reform in Washington, given the gridlock? Is it big, hairy, comprehensive inform, uh, reform, or is it incremental? Well, uh, I think that you have a moment right now where there's daylight. There's more daylight than there's been since at least 2006, 2007. And so I would say the smart thing to do is, is what the Senate and what the President seem to be doing, which is to try and seize that moment and find a common ground between the Senate's framework and the President's framework and try and push the House as much as possible to get there. And really the fault line at this point is whether or not the 11 million people here who are undocumented, illegal, whatever word you want to use, whether there's going to be a pathway to citizenship for them or not. The Senate and the President have suggested that uh, if they do certain things, you know, if they pay a fine, pay back taxes, go to the end of the, go to the, end of the line, so to speak, learn English, they could earn uh, legal permanent residency and then eventually citizenship. The uh, House Republicans are very much, seem to be very much opposed to that idea. They, they would rather keep them uh, just as lawful permanent residents or something less than that, but they can stay. Um, that's going to be the big hump to get over, is, is their compromise that's there. The DREAM Act, all of that, I don't, I don't know that there's much discussion or, or debate about that in terms of getting a majority in the House right now. I think, I think they're right now is a bipartisan coalition of Republicans and Democrats who would support legislation that includes a pathway to citizenship. In other words, I think if you put that bill on the floor right now, it would pass. Uh, if you look at the three or four sizable bills that have been passed in the Congress since January, Sandy, Vara, the debt ceiling extension, um, you'll notice that a third to 40 percent of the Republican caucus has supported these measures along with an overwhelming number of Democrats. Uh, and so together, that group has essentially carried the day. And that is a more center group, essentially. And then you have the folks uh, who includes the chairman of, of the Judiciary Committee, Ch uh, Chairman Goodlatte, uh, and who, you know, essentially on the right, uh, who don't want to allow any of that stuff and voted against all of it. Uh, but this center group, essentially, who is willing to pass these pieces of legislation. So I actually think if they let him on the floor today, I think he would pass. That if, if Boehner right. doesn't, if doesn't to the Haster rule. Right. If Boehner dropped the Haster rule in the way that he's done for these last three or four votes, uh, and the Haster rule, uh, and I, I, I give an explanation of it because I didn't even realize it until about a year ago, but the Haster rule in the way that the, this speaker, Speaker Boehner has governed, uh, is this. He, will not allow any piece of legislation to come to the floor of the House for a vote unless a majority of the majority supports it already. So unless more, more than half of the Republicans support a piece of legislation, he won't bring it to the floor. Yeah, regardless of whether overall you would have over 270. Right. Regardless of what the Democrats do. Uh, and that, that, that practice is a modern or contemporary practice in American politics. It was first employed by Denny Hastert who was a speed Republican speaker in the 1990s, early 2000s, uh, actually started by Newt Gingrich and then Denny Hastert, right, exactly. and now uh, Speaker Boehner. Jeb Bush, a Spanish-speaking former governor of Florida, viewed as uh, 
um, relatively moderate for his party um, on this issue, uh, came out yesterday as part of a book tour, and he's now seems to be backing away from path to citizenship. Um, does that put a wrinkle in the path? Is that because uh, we're not going to? He's not going to lift the Hassett rule tomorrow. So sure. a lot of stuff, a lot can happen between now and then. Um, yeah. How does that concern you? No, no, I, I, Either one of them. I, I was surprised to hear that yesterday. Um, uh, former Governor Bush, who has been fairly um, centrist or even progressive on this issue, certainly President Bush, who supported the path to citizenship, uh, you know, his brother is essentially breaking with him on that and wrote the book saying, instead of providing a path to citizenship, what we should offer is permanent, permanent residency, essentially, without a path to citizenship. But then it was on morning journal or, or maybe the daily rundown with Chuck Todd this morning, and when was asked, he said, you know, there may be some path to citizenship that I could support if such and such conditions were present. Bush, so Bush is now basically claiming that the book publishing industry is too <laughs> slow. For, it's, it's moving faster than, than, than the Republican Party is moving faster than the book publishing industry. Well, maybe he should have written an e-book. There you go. Um, Marco Rubio. Uh, there's a lot of hope in the Republican Party that uh, Marco Rubio, if he's on the ticket, could change the perception of Hispanics about the Republican Party. It may even change all of Americans' perceptions about the Republican Party, make it look a, a little bit more moderate and, and, and less intolerant. Um, do you buy into that? Can, can one man change uh, the image of a party? Well, I think that it can hurt. Uh, you know, I think Joaquin and I both give uh, Senator Rubio a lot of credit because he, he has been an articulate spokesperson for the Republican Party. Uh, to his credit, uh, he's worked with the group of eight folks in the Senate to try and move Republicans to the middle, at least on the issue of immigration reform. So I think it's a good thing. Um, but I would also say that just like any other group, that, that Hispanics around the nation are not going to vote for someone just because of the color of their skin or their last name. Uh, they're going to vote for them based on the policies that they embrace. And so both with the Republicans and the Democrats, they're going to get judged on the policies that they embrace. I'll give you a good example of that in Texas. During this last election cycle, of course, Ted Cruz was on the same ballot with Mitt Romney. And in Burr County, uh, Mitt Romney actually outpolled Ted Cruz. Now, Burr County has one of the largest aggregations of Hispanic voters uh, in Texas, of course, along with the Valley. So if there's a place that you would think that if this guy was going to get crossover support from Hispanics for having the last name Cruz, Burr County would be it. But he got a lower percentage than Mitt Romney because he was so far to the right. And that's the way that democracy should work. It should work like that, based on people's policies, their ideas, whether you agree with them or disagree with them on those things. I think that that's great because it's a signal of maturity within the Hispanic electorate. Uh, and that's what we can expect going forward in 2016 and beyond that. Do you want to add anything? Oh, no, I mean, I, I think I agree. I think, um, he's, I think he's been a good shot in the arm for the Republican Party and has given him uh, some great perspective on us, particularly on the issue of immigration. Um, you know, and, and I think it's great that he's been able to work with Senator McCain, uh, the group of eight in the Senate. That's promising. Uh, Mayor, San Antonio is obviously a big military city. Um, how does sequestration concern you um, in regards to uh, cuts to the military? What, what, if any, effect is we, would sequestration have if this goes on through the summer, let's say? Well, uh, we're very concerned because San Antonio has the largest joint basing operation in the Department of Defense. We have uh, just over 75,000 folks, DOD folks, in San Antonio, and just a whole host of missions. So our concern uh, is we want to ensure that the missions that are in San Antonio and that are vital to the national defense are preserved, that they're supported. Obviously, it's, it's a challenge to do that when you have across the board cuts and you don't know exactly what direction they're going to take and which missions are going to impact the most. Uh, so I think like every community, uh, San Antonio is first of all hoping that, that in D.C. they're able to come to a compromise before the end of the month. I know that we triggered on March 1, but there's a little bit of time here to work things out. Uh, because if it does go into the summer, uh, you know, we're very concerned about what might happen to some of these missions since San Antonio has so many of them. What are the chances you and your colleagues are going to be able to help them there? <laughs> I hope they're good. Um, it's been something else. Um, let, let me make a statement generally. You know, I've only been here two months. Uh, 
Don't blame him. No, yeah. Don't blame me. Uh, don't blame me. Uh, this was passed in 2011. Okay. Um, you won't be able to say that in a couple of years. It, it is. It is very strange to be part of a group that's not held in high esteem. I mean, this really is the first time in my life that I'm part of something yeah. that I know is not popular. It's a very. It's a very. Like you, this guy was a lawyer before. Yeah. That's saying a lot. An apologies. <laughs> <laughs> even lower, even lower, even lower, yeah. Um, you know, it's strange because I think, I feel as though the biggest obstacle to the, at this point, the biggest obstacle to the recovery of the economy is the Congress. And I think that's a very sad statement for our country. The Congress needs to get out of the way, essentially, at this point. Um, we cannot be fighting over the debt ceiling. Uh, the debt is a very important issue. Probably the most important issue, but the solution is going to be one that is a long-term one, not one that you're fighting over every six months. Uh, when you add all of the media speculation about it, all of the media coverage, and all of the anxiety that that causes in the business world and throughout American life, it, it, I think we're doing it the wrong way. Uh, but to answer your question, do I think there's a chance? I do. Uh, I think in the next few weeks, I think we're going to come to some kind of agreement. Uh, of course, I'm hopeful that we'll come to an agreement. I think the public wants us to fix this sequester. If I, if I learn one thing in 25 years of parenting, it's that it, whenever, there, whenever there's a fight, both sides are somehow responsible. One might, be, one, one might have started it, one might be more at fault, but it takes two to tangle. True. So where is uh, President Obama? What is his responsibility and accountability here? Well, I, mean, I think you saw him, for example, get into serious talks uh, on March 1st, on, fr on Friday, March 1st. A little late, don't you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the deadline was passed. It was yeah. a little up. So, what else could the president have done to, to stop? Well, I mean, I think, I mean, look, I think you've got to bring everybody to the table. Um, you know, we're going to have to figure out a way to make sure that we're dealing with our debt in a long-term way that's not squeezing everything into this short period of time, um, you know, and, and we, we believe and we're hopeful that they will give on some of these tax loopholes, closing some of these tax loopholes. Uh, they will do it in, in some kind of a balanced way. Um, but what, what concerns me beyond just this sequester issue is this fight has come up now at least three times right, on the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling vote comes up about once every year or year and a half. So my question for John Boehner, or for Republican leadership is, are you going to do this every year or year and a half? Because if we're going to have this fight every year and a half, it's going to be incredibly disruptive to the country. I mean, this is all we'll be talking about for the next four years. We are, this was the fifth fiscal showdown since Republicans took over. Sure. But I get back to my question. Um, maybe I wasn't clear enough. Does the president have any responsibility? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. In, in, uh, I think, I think what should he have done better? Well, I think that he, sh that he needs to be a leader in the negotiation, uh, that he has a responsibility to bring both sides to the table, to be clear about what he's offering and what he expects from the other side. Um, and also, I think that, that my sense in Washington, and in, in, independent of the president or the speaker or, or the same majority leader, uh, a lot of battles are fought out in the media rather than talked through in person. Uh, I've noticed that in the short time that I'm here, is that people tend to communicate through the press a lot. Uh, and on something like this, you know, that may work on some issues or you can get away with it on some issues, but on something like this, uh, that's not the right way to go. Back to the military, if we could, um, this would be to both of you, but from different angles. Um, we're drawing down, in, we've already drawn down in Iraq, the president kept his promise there, and we're drawing down in Afghanistan, the president is keeping his promise there. There's a lot of men and women coming back um, with some severe needs, um, and they're not being met right now. What can a, a mayor do with the resources you have um, to help these people, and, and wh when is Congress going to step up and take care of these men and women? Well, I think there are a lot of things that local communities can do, and this is to, to take uh, the conversation back to the issue of uh, skills and training. Uh, one of the things that Councilwoman Ivy Taylor led an effort on was to uh, partner with St. Philip's College to uh, 
in the city to, to create uh, a resource center for veterans as they come back to be able to get placed into the community college system uh, and into job training so that they can get the skills that they need if they don't already have them to be employable and also as as a place where employers can go knowing that they can find uh, some of these skilled veterans uh, i know that uh, folks companies involved in the eagleford show uh, play as well have had veterans job fairs in San Antonio and we have, we, uh, have encouraged that. Uh, we're looking, uh, we've thought about in San Antonio making as part of our, our um, affirmative action program uh, veterans giving points for, for being a veteran which some other cities have done and I think would be appropriate as well for San Antonio. So there are several things that cities can do that are concrete uh, policies uh, to help ensure that it's a smoother transition than has sometimes been the case. Okay, sure. No, and I agree with those things. And the president, uh, a few years ago, did pick up on a campaign to hire a vet. Uh, so but he's been active on that. But there's essentially four things I would do when they come in. And this is an, this would, is an interagency cooperation that requires cooperation across agencies. Uh, I would essentially assess them for any kind of physical needs, treatment, uh, mental health treatment, uh, any workforce treatment, and any education requirements. Uh, those four things, I think. Uh, in terms of legislation that I think the Congress should pursue, we need to pursue uh, parity for mental health coverage with physical, the same coverage that we give to physical ailments, we need to give to mental health uh, ailments. Um, we have seen, in a very tragic way lately, uh, the effects of not treating mental health in the same way and not covering it in the same way we cover somebody who's got a broken arm or something like that uh, in the texas legislature i carried a bill to do a small piece of that which was to include in texas insurance coverage uh, treatment for kids with serious emotional disturbances you know you've, you've got kids that are 16 years old 14 years old and literally their parents cannot handle them uh, they've got serious emotional disturbances uh, you know, that aside, you have a lot of vets who come back with PTSD and other mental health ailments, and we need to be there for them. Yeah, I think we're time's just about up. Let me just close with a couple lighter questions. Uh, to you, Governor, or Governor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got a promotion or demotion? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Governor didn't surprise you. Yeah. 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 So you're on your way. Um, what was, what's been the most pleasant surprise about Washington, sir, and the most unpleasant surprise? Oh, man, the most unpleasant surprise. <laughs> uh, the most pleasant surprise, um, you know, I, I, and I think everybody in San Antonio knows this, but I really love being from San Antonio. I mean, San Antonio is always in my heart and mind. And what's interesting about this place is that you're always associated with where you're from. When I was in the legislature, for example, there were 10 of us that were from San Antonio. You know, here, there's only two of us, Lamar and me, that are from San Antonio. Uh, so essentially being able to carry the banner for our city, uh, that's been very special for me, my hometown. Um, and in terms of unpleasantness, uh, trying to find a place to live, actually, is uh, I'm still trying to close on a small condo that I started this transaction in January, and I still feel very unsettled here. Uh, so that's been, that's kind of been a hassle. Wait till you get that first mortgage payment. Yeah, yeah, I know, I'm expecting it. And what is, uh, as mayor of San Antonio, what's the first thing you've asked of your congressman? And what's mm -hmm. the biggest ask you plan to make of it? <laughs> well, my first ask was don't mess up, because yeah. he embarrassed me. How's he done so far? <laughs> Very well, so far so good. But I think, you know, more seriously, and the purpose that everybody is, is uh, here for is, you know, we want someone who is a champion for, for San Antonio, who is able to work with everyone. San Antonio has a huge investment from the federal government. That has been an uh, enormous part of San Antonio's success. And so whether it's the military bases uh, or uh, funding for uh, infrastructure or education funding, uh, we want to make sure that, that our congressional representatives are always vigilant and they're always advocating for the right types of investments. And that's the serious conversation that we've had. And so it goes without saying, of course, that, that now I have at least one congressperson that will listen to me. <laughs> so. Well, I want to thank both of you for doing this. Please, everybody, thank, thank both of you. Thank you, guys.